Um, my grandmother's name is Helen Pinalto McGinnis, and she's still alive. My connection to Tawny Town is that my grandmother um, was born there, and both of her parents um, were from Italy. Uh, her father was on the first ship from Italy uh, for Sunnyside, and uh, then her mother's family came and joined in 1905. They came directly to Tawny Town because they'd heard that it was a good place to come. During the late 19th century, there's a huge amount of Italian immigration all over the New World. There are, there are Italians in Argentina. Um, there are Italians all over the United States. In the U.S., they were going mostly to major cities. And so there were some growing concerns, not just by Americans who weren't really sure about these Italians coming in who weren't assimilating, weren't becoming American enough, um, but also concerns on the part of Italian officials and Roman Catholic Church officials who were concerned that these Italian immigrants were being exploited, um, that they were coming, they were kind of being lied to um, in Italy, encouraged to move to the United States, mainly just to make money off of them on the ships. And then when they got here, they weren't finding anything, to, any way to be successful. So one of those people who was concerned was Father Peter Bandini. And um, he was working with the Catholic Church in New York City uh, with a group that was organized to help Italian immigrants. And he had an idea that they really shouldn't be trying to come into major cities. They should be going to rural areas and be farmers because that's what they were doing in Italy. And if they could do that here, they would be more successful. Bandini, as an official um, who was already working with Italian immigrants, he somehow connected, and this is the part we don't really know much about, he connected with Austin Corbin, who owned Sunnyside Plantation in Chico County, Arkansas, right on the Mississippi River. It's the furthest south and east county in the state. Um, it is flat, delta land, it's hot, it's humid, it's, they grew cotton. Now, Corbin didn't live there. He was an investor, basically. He lived in Connecticut, which is part of how he could have connected with Bandini in New York. However it originally worked out, they decided to, in a way, go in together on this experiment. Uh, Corbin needed someone who had sanction from the Italian government and had connections, someone that Italian immigrants would trust, um, and, and Bandini offered that. So, Throughout 1893, 1894, and 1895, they recruit, they make this plan, um, and the first ships leave Genoa that fall of 1895. Um, and they arrive, the first one arrives in New Orleans um, in November of 1895. Now, New Orleans had lynched eight Italian immigrants um, just four years earlier. So this is not popular, <laughs> uh, not a popular thing for Italians to be coming up, especially to go through New Orleans. Now they were just going right past New Orleans up the Mississippi River to Chico County. Um, Sunnyside Plantation had its own port even. So, uh, but there's a notice in the Times-Picayune newspaper in New Orleans saying Austin Corbin's Italians have arrived and then basically, and they aren't staying. <laughs> so they're moving on. Uh, so we have some record of that arrival. They, um, immigration at the time was very simple. Um, immigration officials went out to the ship, counted people. Uh, the records are frustrating for me because they aren't very thorough at all. They misspelled names, they miscounted people. And um, so they, sh they changed ships from an ocean-going vessel to one that would go up the Mississippi River, and they arrived in Sunnyside. After that first ship, another two came. Both of those went through New York. And um, with the last group to arrive, Bandini, we think, um, took the train with them across the country to Sunnyside. So there's a myth in, in Tawny Town a bit that Bandini didn't know about Sunnyside until things started to go bad down there. But we've recently, through um, Dr. Edward Stabile, who just wrote a book about Bandini um, and some other research, come to realize that he was probably involved from the start and an advocate for the Italians from the very beginning. Um, the colony had some issues, and they, some of the language on how they referred to themselves is important. They talk about it as a colony, as colonizers. They're wanting to borrow that imagery from 
American heritage, right? Not immigrants, colonizers. Um, and it's a, it's a conscious decision that they use that language a lot. So the colony in Sunnyside, part of the problem was that they recruited Italians from Northern Italy. And um, there was some racism to that. Southern Italians were darker um, and there was a sense that they weren't as good or whatever um, turn of the century type of racism would have defined. Uh, but these Northern Italians didn't really know what to do with cotton agriculture. They had raised corn um, they, and, and grapes and hogs and to be cotton, you know, cotton sharecroppers was not really what they knew how to do. They were willing to learn, um, but when malaria and yellow fever started to hit, it, it, it ravaged um, the Italians. A lot of people died from those diseases. And then Austin Corbin was killed in a carriage accident in Connecticut. And his heirs to this property were not interested in this experiment that Corbin had been doing. And Corbin's plan originally was that these were 20-year or 20-year contracts for land, and at the end of the 20 years, the Italians would own the land. Um, but his heirs weren't interested in giving away land in that way, even though it wasn't really giving it away. It was an investment, and they would have made money off of it. So they start trying to get out of it a little bit. Um, they aren't interested in continuing with the improvements that the Italians wanted for cleaner water uh, and for better houses. And so um, that, on top of the disease, uh, led Bandini uh, to start looking for perhaps another place for the Italians to move. And I get the feeling that that was a controversial decision um, with the, within the colony itself uh, to leave where they had started to get established and start all over again, even though it was only a year or 18 months later that they started looking into this. If you talk to some of the Italians in Lake Village, which is what Sunnyside is known as now, um, we're the wimpy ones that couldn't hack it down there and we ran away up to Tawny Town. And um, so it just depends on your perspective. You talk to some of the old folks in Tawny Town and they'll still talk about Chico County as like you could get sick from malaria. My grandmother has said that. Oh, you don't want to go in the summertime. You, know, you can get sick down there. Uh, so both sides have their, have their stories. Uh, but Bandini uh, worked to get um, some land uh, that was pretty cheap. Uh, the climate was better. It's cooler up here than it is in South Arkansas, um, a bit drier, people could be, um, recover from their illnesses, and uh, he really thought that there would be some options for agriculture here uh, for them to be successful. Bandini always felt the pressure for this to be a successful colony, always. He felt like everyone was watching, um, and partially because he advertised it. This is the colony, this, this amazing colony, it's a successful experiment in Italian immigration, and um, so he's looking from right from the start for collective agriculture at first that everyone can participate in, everyone can make some money off of, and that helps them buy their own land and expand. So they start out with strawberries, um, other kind of low row fruits. Um, they plant apple trees. Apple cultivation, of course, was already a big deal up in northwest Arkansas. Um, and they experiment with different options. In 1905, the ambassador uh, from Italy comes to visit Tommy Town, and the whole town shows out as this, you know, look how wonderful it is, look how amazing it is. And he writes up um, back in Italy and then reprinted here in the United States, glowing reports, how their houses are nicer than the even the Americans in Northwest Arkansas. Their 4th of July celebration was like nothing Northwest Arkansas had ever seen. So the Italians have to be more American than the Americans. The problem with that part of the story is that it wasn't entirely accurate. Um, because, yes, they're able to be relatively successful in Tawny Town, but it's not enough. And so uh, they are sending their sons off to work in the coal mines in Oklahoma. They're in Wilburton, they're in Krebs, they travel by train, um, and it's seasonal. So they'll, they'll go out there uh, for a few months and then they'll come back for holidays. Uh, there's a correspondent for 
the Tawny for the Springdale News, who's writing about what's happening in Tawny Town. Everybody does this. It's local gossip. Johnson has one. Um, uh, Elm Springs has a columnist, and Tawny Town has one too, because of course they have to fit in. And um, so they're writing. They mention comings and goings of people. In um, 1900 or 1901, uh, one of the boys, and he was 14. Um, was in an accident in Wilburton in one of the coal mines and lost his leg. He was amputated at the hip. And um, he lived, the, he, he made it work. Um, he has all kinds of jobs. I found him um, working in Niles, Ohio. Uh, that's where he signed his draft card for World War I. Even if you only had one leg, you have to sign your draft card <laughs> just to prove that yeah, you're at least present. So um, it starts out as coal mining but they get connections and they connect with other Italian immigrants. Uh, the Sisters of Mercy are pretty helpful. Um, now the Sisters of Mercy are a Catholic order that their mission are poor people. And in the United States, uh, they did a lot of work on the edges of kind of expansion. Not really like pioneer days necessarily, but like just the next step after pioneer days when People are settling, but there aren't schools established and there aren't hospitals established. The Sisters of Mercy would come in and do that. They taught the Italians English, um, and then they also seem to be helping build connections. So you find out the Sisters of Mercy might move to a new place and hear about some options for work, and they make sure that information gets back to Tawny Town. And I'm sure they're doing that for many other communities too, but Tawny Town really benefited from that. Um, especially since they don't necessarily know the language um, and you know they're new to the entire country. So by the start of, of World War I, actually the draft cards that all of the, um, the men had to sign give a really cool snapshot of where they're all working. So there's a photograph from um, around 1900 of altar boys. So they're all under you know 15 years old. Half of those kids, 15 years later-ish, at the start of World War I, half of them are working outside of Tiny Town. Now you ask their descendants, and their descendants will say, oh, yeah, maybe for a few years, no, no, so-and-so worked away. But it looks like they were working away for at least a decade or a decade and a half. Um, the Tiny Town, this first generation, had a pattern of delaying marriage until they were in their late 20s or early 30s because they wanted to own their own homes and own their own farms. And it, the elders of the community were not accepting of, well, I'm going to get married and then I'm going to go run off and do a job far away. No, you had to be able to afford to stay with your family and, and have your farm or you needed to wait to get married. And so um, it's a, a pattern that kind of, it goes away, especially after World War II, but that first generation. If they immigrated as kids, a lot of them didn't get married until they were close to 30, women included. Um, so the young women are also working out. Um, so there's an article, a little notice in the Springdale News about a group that has gone up to Niles, Ohio. This was um, Carnegie Steel and this, this is the steel producing part of Ohio, lots of factory jobs. And um, not only were there young men up there, but there were just as many sisters, uh, little sisters, older sisters that had gone up to find work too. Now they tended to go later. The brothers would go first and then they would send word, okay, you know, you can send little sister up here too. Um, and so the, the draft cards showed a bunch of, a, a pretty, pretty big group in Niles, Ohio. Um, one of the Tesaro brothers is in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, it looks like he's doing seasonal crop picking. Um, there are a handful in St. Louis. There are still connections between Tawny Town and St. Louis. Um, there are still a bunch in Oklahoma doing mining work. Um, George uh, Penalto, uh, whose given name was Hyacinth, I'm so glad they named him that because it made him really easy to find in the records. Uh, but he decided to go by George, I think, after the war because it doesn't translate as well. Hyacinth doesn't sound as tough, I don't think. Um, he is a brakeman for the Pennsylvania Railroad who lives in Allegheny County. That's where he signed his um, draft card. So 
this pattern of going out to work and making money and then coming back to the community and buying your house or buying your farm more accurately um, was really important. What starts to help change that is grape cultivation. And um, they had experimented with different crops that could make money. And there are some old pictures of the kids picking strawberries, but there are old pictures of kids uh, picking apples. Uh, and they had started produce, or started growing grapes, but they needed the railroad to catch up um, so that they could transport grapes before they went bad. And even then, it wasn't quite working until Welch's came along. And Welch's offers them contracts for grapes, and they're going, and they, they start looking at building a plant in Springdale um, to juice the grapes and pr start producing grape juice. The other part of the timing on this that's interesting is that it's right at the start of Prohibition. So Felix Artemani, uh, who's the kind of patriarch of the Artemani clan, he's, um, he's, he immigrated as an adult and uh, with his family. In the 1920s, he shows up in the Salisaw, Oklahoma newspaper as a grape expert that has come over to see if the land would be good for them to try to grow grapes there. Berryville talks about Felix Artemani coming to visit. Joplin talks about Felix Artemani coming to visit and talk to them about grapes. Now, Welch's did offer a contract, and you can make some money off of Welch's. But it's also prohibition, and I think they were making wine. <laughs> so it shows up a little bit in there, like they hint at it. Um, so it's... I, I want to be careful about making a big deal about, oh, everybody decided to be decided to grow grapes for juice when I suspect that they were motivated by being able to produce um, wine at home and try to get around the officials. So that is what leads to the Grape Festival becoming the event that we know it as today. So there had always been a fall, or a, actually more more accurately, a late summer event in Tawnytown. Um, and they called it a picnic for a long time. There's a letter from Governor Bruff um, around 1908, 1909 uh, to Father Bandini congratulating him on Grape Day. It was just Grape Day. Uh, but it was very much a community event. Welch's sees that this is already going on and decides to make a big deal out of it. Um, and that's when we have the first Queen Concordia, the first great festival queen. And my favorite is people who think that it's a beauty pageant. It's not a beauty pageant. This is Tawny Town. They're always hustling. It's the young woman who can sell the most raffle tickets as a fundraiser uh, for whatever they're giving away. Right? These days and for a long time, it's always been a car or a truck. Um, but Queen Concordia sells raffle tickets, and that's how she's chosen. She's the most successful at that. So there is a photograph of Posa's store, and that looks like one of the first stores. And it has, it's, a, it's obviously kind of an Ozark vernacular looking general store. Um, it's got great vines or some vines climbing up the side of it, and it does have a, a post office kind of hanging shingle out front too. So that's one of the oldest ones, oldest photographs and oldest known post office that I know of. Uh, Bandini had wanted, Bandini seemed to have a checklist of, of things that he felt would show that the community was being successful. A post office was on the list and a railroad station was on the list. He wanted the railroad to come through Tawny Town. So Poses was the first general store we know that uh, two of the young women in the community uh, had a hat shop. They opened a mil millinery shop. Uh, Kate Penalto and um, Josephine um, Pantaleone, who becomes Josephine Maestri. She married Leo Maestri. Uh, that, that was their business, these young women um, starting their own business. <coughs> in terms of... Um, There's also a photo that's in the Tawny Town book that I don't know what my parents are doing, um, of the first brick store in town, brick business in town, and it's a corner. Uh, and actually, Dick Taldo, the one who lost his leg, he's standing in front of it with his pant leg pinned up and he's on a crutch. Uh, he, he was a bookkeeper a lot of the time after he had his accident. 
um, in Pinetown. Um, and that building tended to be multi-purpose. So sometimes it was a bank, sometimes it was a general store. Uh, they tried to buy most of their staples in Tawny Town if they could. But there's also a, a good connection with Johnson, actually. Um, and so I don't know if it's just the, the way that roads went then. It was easier to get to Johnson than to go all the way into Springdale. Um, but they used the mill at Johnson uh, to mill their corn mostly um, into uh, cornmeal. Now they made polenta out of it instead of um, grits or uh, other things that, you know, cornbread uh, that the Ozarkers were doing. Uh, so I always thought that was interesting that I, I was all, I, when I first had grits, I was like, oh, that's, that's polenta. <laughs> there are very few things that get passed down, I think, this far from uh, the Italian origins. But that one, that was one for me, that polenta and grits, I didn't understand why they had different names. Um, so they got, they, they were able to, especially early on, kind of carefully become a part of the community in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, it helped that it wasn't heavily populated. And so they were able to kind of be, be on their own when they needed to, and then send out the ones that had learned English the best. <laughs> to go and interact with the community and show that, yeah, we've, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying, we're, we're being good Americans. Uh, they talked in the, the newspaper about, um, they made sure that the community knew that they celebrated Thanksgiving and they wrote up about the Thanksgiving play that the kids had at the school. Um, they talked about earlier than that in 1901, they talked about McKinley's assassination and made sure that got reported to the Springdale news. We mourn, President McKinley's death, and we we draped the the church in black flags and or black banners, and um, so they're they're very conscious of that, making sure that they fit in. The reception of the local community it was mixed, and it, when the Italians first arrived, and it at first there's a lot of just concern who are these people they don't speak english uh they use the term dagos the dagos are coming um and that's something that with the, with interaction tended to go away a bit um so once you once you got to know the italians and realized they were okay or once the italians started buying stuff at your shop a lot then you you know you decided to let it go um, I hadn't heard the story about uh, any retraction of that, so of that article in the newspaper about the Dagos are coming. So I'm not, I, I can't confirm on that one. There was after in, into the 19 teens, um, anti-Catholicism is a big deal in the country, um, and it's it has a weird paranoia to it. Um, so in here in Arkansas, they passed laws requiring that the local sheriff inspect um, any convent and um, any Catholic school. Subiaco Abbey down in Paris, Arkansas, got inspected because they were suspecting that there might be bad rituals happening. And the sheriff liked the place and decided to send his son to school there. <laughs> um, uh, Gentry... Gentry had um, an anti-Catholic newspaper, um, very strong, very active, very um, concerned about the Catholic scourge that was invading the United States. And he made some allusions to Tiny Town and concerned that what these priests were doing was recruiting immigrants to come over here and make the entire United States Catholic. And that was their plan. And obviously, he's talking about Tawny Town. He's, you know, a priest that recruited immigrants. Um, and so Tawny Town, most people in Tawny Town just tried, did, did their best to lay low and just be friendly and not rile anything up. Um, by the 1920s, when we have the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan that was also really playing more on being anti-Catholic around here than being anti-African-American because there's not a huge African-American population. Um, the Italians are able to at least achieve a level of acceptance where people might still be anti-Catholic, people might still be anti-immigrant, but they would say, oh, oh, but you're okay. 
well, you're a good one, you know, and expect that that's a compliment <laughs> uh, to the Italians. So they're able to, to make do. Service in the World Wars helps them assimilate a lot because Tawny Town is able to show that their young men fought just like the young men from Prairie Grove, just like the men from Cane Hill, just like the men from Springdale. And they, you know, they did their part. Um, they worked really hard to raise money for the Red Cross during both wars. Uh, they worked hard to raise money for um, war bonds and show, and they're always making sure everybody, that, that pressure that Tawny Town feels to be model immigrants. Here, see, we did this, we're in. Um, and that helps with, helping the locals accept the Italian community. They could also put on a good show of being Italian when they needed to. I think that comes out in the Great Festival a lot. Um, that, you know, oh, if people want a flavor of Italy, okay, we'll, do, we'll put that one on. Um, oh, people want a good American businessman, oh, we can do that too. Um, what about during World War II, whenever obviously Italy was one of the Axis powers, how did that dynamic change and impact the community of Tawny Town? I'd like to restate that in the, okay. your answer. So with World War I, Italy was an ally, so that was very simple. In World War II, uh, with the Italians being on the wrong side of things, uh, Tawny Town had to be even more careful about how they're presenting themselves and um, how they are uh, showing that they're supporting the war effort and showing that they're American. For the Japanese, in comparison, in some ways, you know, they get they get rounded up and put in internment camps. Even World War One veterans among the Japanese, the Italians don't experience any of that. Um, what I have heard is that there was some additional scrutiny from federal officials. If so, when the Italians first arrived before um, before the change in immigration laws in the 1920s. You could just kind of show up. So in World War II, the men were drafted. They participated in the draft just like everyone else. So for that part of things, the, the, the greatest generation, the ones who served, they got drafted, they went off and served. I've heard that the military might have decided to send them to the Pacific Theater rather than sending them to Europe just because the Italian, Italians weren't on the right side. Um, but I've also heard that they've used their language skills um, in speaking Italian. So it just depends. There were a lot of Tawny Town men who did end up going to the Pacific and they trained in California. For the community, um, they did experience some additional scrutiny um, if they hadn't kept up with their immigration status. So everything changed in the 1920s and it became much more difficult to become a citizen, um, it became much more difficult to vote. Uh, the Italians paid their poll taxes in 1899 and 1900 in Washington County and voted uh, because all they had to do at that time to get the right to vote was to sign a declaration of intent to become a citizen and it actually benefited them to vote because the concern was that these immigrants didn't understand democracy and wouldn't value the uh, privilege of voting. And so if you were an immigrant who figures out how to vote, then you're showing that you are, that you get it, you understand democracy and you understand this responsibility of being an American. It's a really different mindset than what we have now. And, um, but if you had never followed up on that declaration of intent to become a citizen, you could be in a bit of a limbo with federal law at that point as to whether or not you are actually supposed to be here. So I've heard that a couple of people may have gotten deported or asked to come and complete some paperwork. Um, I've heard that they confiscated shortwave radios um, and didn't want the Italians being able to talk to anyone back in Italy. Um, and I've heard Italians that, or heard of people in Tawny Town who use the shortwave radios to talk to people in Italy and catch up on family. So it just, um, it just depends. For the most part, they weren't, they didn't experience a ton of, of additional discrimination from what I've heard. Um, they were, by World War II, pretty accepted into the community um, and accepted into Northwest Arkansas. Um, there's a story in the Memories book about some of the voting. Um, by, 
by the 1940s, most people, if they are young enough that they're looking for a job or they're going to school, then they're at least bilingual. And most of, so you might hear Italian in the home, but they're able to speak English outside of the home. Uh, so what I have heard is that Tawnytown was a solid voting block, that they all voted together, and that that's why someone would want to come to Tawnytown and talk to a few people and say, you know, I want your endorsement because if I get your endorsement, everybody here is going to vote for me. Um, I've heard there were two people that were not um, that were not Democrats. So Arkansas's experienced the the party flip um, since this originally, but um, that there were two Republicans and the Republican Party wasn't very strong in Arkansas until the 1960s. Um, but Ronaldo Morsani was a Republican because he could get some money from the Republican Party uh, for being in charge of that part of the county. So that's why he was a Republican. The other Republican in town was Katie Neal and her father was um, a railroad agent that was courted by Father Bandini. So I talked about how in Tawnytown they worked really hard to show how American they were. One of the things that they did um, early on was made, they made a big deal out of commemorating Abraham Lincoln's 100th birthday. Um, and they talk about how they had a Union flag from the Civil War that had bullet holes in it and blood on it and that they made a big deal out of the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's birth. So in the context of this trying to win over the locals, during that time in Northwest Arkansas, everybody was really proud of their Confederate heritage. So this was a little odd to see that they were doing this. Um, but turns out James Neal provided the shot up bloody flag um, and had a connection to the, to the railroad. And so perhaps the show on the part of Tawny Town for Lincoln's birthday and their um, Americanness in that way was really more to play to railroad agents. A lot, even at the turn of the century, um, a lot of the railroad agents were still Union veterans or immediate descendants, sons of Union veterans. And so this was a way to play on Americanness in order to get the railroad. Uh, they got the railroad kind of at the wrong time, really. Uh, within a few years that Bandini finally got the railroad to come to Tawny Town, around 1910, um, there were cars coming. And once the car came, uh, the, the railroad really kind of failed. So it ran for maybe 15, 20 years to Tawny Town, and then it was a losing proposition economically, and so the railroad left. Uh, but that it, it, it shows up in photographs and um, in notes um, from Father Bandini as this huge accomplishment for him. He was very excited, very proud of it. And then it's eclipsed by the car so quickly that people don't even realize sometimes that there have been a railroad that came to Tawny Town. Bandini was concerned about the Italians fitting in. And so he made sure to bring in a teacher or teachers, depending on the year, um, to teach everyone English. So being taught English, I believe, started in the school in Sunnyside. Um, and the Sisters of Mercy were teaching um, the students there. Um, a graduate of St. Mary's Academy um, in Little Rock, who had come with the Mercies to Sunnyside, came up to Tawny Town with a smaller group um, and she, her name was um, Miss Bernadette Brady. Uh, she was the first school teacher in Tawny Town. She was about 15 and had about 50 students. And there's a photograph of her in front of the school. And um, she taught a lot of the Italians English um, and became bilingual herself. And she taught school um, at the mines in Oklahoma, mining communities in Oklahoma that had different Italian immigrants from our Italian immigrants um, there. So she, she used that. For um, the pattern that I've seen is um, just typical with most people who immigrate and have to learn a new language. If you're over about 25 years old, you have a lot of trouble learning a new language, your brain changes. And so the older generation in Tawny Town was like that. Um, they spoke Italian at home, they might learn enough to get by, 
um, but it wasn't going to be their, their language of choice. The younger you were when you immigrated, um, the more likely you were to learn English. There's, there's a story about my great-grandmother, um, and she immigrated when she was five in 1905 and came to Tawny Town, that Dr. Heifel um, would come, he was the, you know, this was the days of the doctor coming on his horse to visit your house, that he would stop and pick her up and, and have her translate because her English was so good. Now she was the hero of all of her stories, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that it's accurate, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but they, um, in her household though, my grandmother um, didn't learn English, didn't speak English on a regular basis at least until she went to school. Um, so even though my great grandmother could translate and was bilingual at home, oftentimes they still spoke Italian. Um, but into the 1920s and 1930s, you probably heard a lot of Italian at home. Uh, 1940s, 1950s, it was only the old folks, and they probably only spoke it to each other. And most people, most families were speaking English at home by the 1940s. In terms of you know how Italian, how Italian is Tawny Town, um, and how much has it mattered that people have started to intermarry? Uh, in the 1930s, actually, um, someone who was asked to write about Tawny Town as part of one of those Great Depression Writers Projects like a, a travel guy for Arkansas. C.J. Finger was his name, he was at the University of Arkansas. He has two different quotes that contradict, he contradicts himself. He says, there's no, there's no Italian feeling in Tawny Town at all. And that was his response when he got asked to go out to Tawny Town and talk about this Italian enclave. He's like, oh, they're not really Italian. Um, and then another quote around the same time, he says, oh, there's a great flavor of Italy in Tawny Town. So, there's, it's, I think it's a little of both, that it's, part of it is that chameleon, do you want us to be Italian and we'll give you an Italian show, or do we need to be sober American businessmen and we'll, we'll put that hat on. Um, in the community itself, when it's not feeling like it's being viewed, um, there's, there's still Italian connections. The, the family connections, I think, are what persist more than any real you know, connection to Italy itself. But um, family networks and people knowing each other and knowing how people are related, um, that's, that feels Italian to me. Um, and the, and it can be little things too. Um, knowing that you want terrazzo floors in your house um, from m and Tile or um, he, he, oh. <laughs> he, he went around, you'll probably Oh, okay. Him. Yeah, I think he's just checking. We're almost done, Dad. Um, I had a thought on that Italianness, Italianness. Um, you were talking about some people want terrazzo floors. Yeah. Um, there, I can always find um, this certain brand of Italian lotion at my grandma's house. I don't know, I have no clue where she even gets it. Um, but uh, it's, it's small connections like that that, that they've maintained. Um, in terms of identity as Italian, intermarriage, and there was a lot more intermarriage going on early on than I think people remember. Um, the, there was a local family by the last name of Bash that owned land near Tawny Town. All the Bashes married Italians. And we're talking 19 aughts, 19 teens. Um, and it seems that looks more like Tawny Town absorbed them <laughs> than the Italians kind of being pulled out of, of Tawny Town. Um, but that kind of push and pull. There's, there was intermarriage um, that happened. My grandmother, though, um, when she married, she'll, she'll say, I married an Americano, and, and my mom didn't like it. Um, and that it took a while for him to be accepted. Um, so sometimes it might depend on the family too. So in terms of people you know, marrying outside of the community, there was a connection with Madison County. I see that. Um, and you know, my grandmother married a boy from Madison County, um, Mary Frances. Maestri Vaughn married Bruce Vaughn from Madison County and they had a photography business in Springdale for years and years. Um, and before that, their you know, generation before them, 
Um, Evangeline Veruki married um, into the Baker family, and her son was Ralph Baker. Um, they call her Evan, um, but that is where it's not Evan, it's Evan because it's Evangeline, and her maiden name was Veruki. So the Italians, Italians have, I don't know if it's assimilated or infiltrated is the right word, but they've definitely become a part of Northwest Arkansas.